Hello, my name is Jez Humble. I'm a site reliability engineer at Google in the USA, working for Google Cloud. And I'm here at GoTo Arhus with Eleanor Sater, who is a principal at System Structure Limited. And uh, Eleanor, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jess. It's lovely to be here with you. Um, yeah, I, so System Structure Limited provides fractional chief information security officer services to uh, startups in the kind of pre-A to post-C range, roughly kind of 20 to 100 engineers. I've been a consultant in the security world for about 20 years and uh, done a bunch of different stuff, threat modeling, um, code review, you name it. Um, now I'm mostly working at kind of the architectural and uh, organizational levels. Um, so I guess I first came to know about you when you were working at Etsy. Yep. Um, I was talking about continuous delivery. You were talking about the work that you were doing at Etsy and it's yep. kind of weird. I just watched your talk, which was amazing. So, you know, you should definitely go and watch Eleanor's <laughs> talk when that comes online um, and nodding along vigorously <laughs> to all of that. Um, <laughs> Because it turns out that, um, that there's kind of a strong connection between those kind of ideas about continuous delivery and, and what it enables yeah. in terms of being able to build secure infrastructures. Yeah. So I was wondering if we could start um, with you talking a little bit about the overlap between those two different worlds. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, security and reliability and resilience and all these things are really tied up into each other. Um, there are other ways to get to a secure system, but it certainly feels like the most cost-effective and functional version of that is building a system that's heavily declarative. So you have infrastructure as code, you have all this stuff that is ephemeral, that is immutable. So, you know, you roll out containers or, you know, serverless jobs, whatever, you know, whatever your particular version of that infrastructure is, but you don't have kind of long-lived system images that are kind of configured in the field over time that slowly change and mutate. You just start with a clean slate, et cetera. Um, you know, all of the same stuff that we do around reliability and like observability. Can we verify the state of things in the, in the, you know, in production and ensure that they're kind of continuously checked against what they should be? All of these things are tools that we use for reliability reasons, for velocity reasons, for a lot of other reasons. But they're also really good tools at building out the kinds of secure systems that work with those other goals. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's. So important and something that a lot of people miss is that mm. there's so much commonality. Um, I mean, what's interesting about Etsy is a lot of the principles you talk about, particularly around ephemeral architecture, yeah. uh, sorry, ephemeral machines and, and declarative um, infrastructure, those are typically applied to cloud. Yeah. But Etsy, of course, you were using bare metal. Yeah. How do you apply those principles in kind of a bare metal environment? It's interesting. It's a lot more complicated. I have uh, another one of my clients right now is also um, on bare metal, and there's a lot of new challenges. I think one of the um, one of the reasons is we've got so used to cloud systems that those part of the parts of the stack have kind of atrophied a lot. So you you end up having to do a certain amount of rolling your own. But I guess the the goals that I want like you still want your workload sandboxed. You want whatever's actually booting on the machines to have, you know, to be as close to read only as you can. You want to make sure that it's refreshed, you know, fairly rapidly. So that means that you still need to have migratable workloads and all the other stuff. I think the nice thing about building on bare metal, although you're kind of stuck in filling a lot of the parts of the stack, but you can also make your stack a lot flatter. Um, I kind of joke at some point that like the Hello World web page, if you want to just stand up a web page that says Hello World on it, but you want to do it properly and scalably and all of these things, that's a 200 person engineering team. You know, because we've got, because the stacks we've built are, so, you know, assuming that you need to build it to scale and you need a data pipeline, you need all these things around that Hello World, which you, you know, you don't, but like if you did. Um, and because stuff is just accreted over the years, we haven't ever really gone back and sort of squashed the stacks back down and been like, okay, you know, why do we have separate control planes for deploy cloud config, job config, and like cluster config? You know, like surely that could probably be one control plane. You know, but then, you know, it's either a lot of vendor lock-in or, you know, like there's still, there are reasons some of those splits exist, but they also massively increase complexity, which means they massively hurt security. Yeah, absolutely. And that was another theme that you talked yeah. about in your talk today. Um, so conversely, it's possible to find people who are all in the clouds, yep. but have built 
a cloud environment that follows old school data center principles? I, sometimes it's the 1990s again, and it's really weird when you run into one of those. They're pretty rare at this point. Like I've, I, I've seen them a couple of times in the past few years. Uh, most people have kind of gotten the memo. It's often I will find in smaller companies, you have some like long lived VMs, and then you've got maybe the start of a little Kubernetes deployment over here, but it only actually runs two jobs, you know, and there's like three nodes in the, you know, and so it's, it's often a bit of a mix because they're still sort of stuck partially between we have to ship features and partially in the like, where we're trying to build out good infrastructure, but often like, if you're lucky, there's somebody who's a staff or a principal engineer who's worked either at one of the big companies or at, at kind of a mid-tier who has a real infrastructure that they're evolving towards. But I find that often, like that's not like technical co-founders are often more from the problem domain than they are from the, I have a, you know, I, the engineering domain kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, and you, uh, you often come into companies when they've been doing stuff for a yeah. while and they haven't really yeah. thought about security. Yeah, I um, mean, that's generally when I come in, is they're like, oh, right, it's time to, we don't know where to start, but we know it's time to start doing something. Yeah. When you come into that situation, you take a look around, yeah. um, what is it that you see that makes you think, oh, this isn't gonna be so hard after all? And then conversely, the follow-up question is, what do you see when you're like, oh no, this is gonna be a total nightmare? I mean, I think there's three things. On the technical side, maybe four things. On the technical side, it's it's some platform choices. Kind of, you know, are they are they using what you kind of think of as internet standard tooling? You know, are you, if you're on a cloud provider, are you on one of the major cloud providers? Um, you know, are you know, do you have some IAC footprint? Like, where are you on that kind of stuff? Um, and then, you know, do you have a pile of, of Windows boxes with no central management on your on your laptop side, or are you on Macs and maybe you've even already got you know one of the one of the management tools in or something like that? Um, and it's also the amount of legacy, right? You know, if it's a twenty person dev team, but they've been running for two years and things seem like and they have documentation, you know, it's always a bad sign when it's like, okay, can I have a network diagram? And they walk towards the whiteboard, <laughs> which is probably two thirds of the of the companies I work with. To be clear, um, you know, it's not like it's not necessarily bad, but it's not a good sign. Um, and and yeah, if you've got a lot of legacy stuff and a lot of legacy complexity that's poorly documented, that's a hard position to come back out of. Um, and then it's kind of do do the execs care, and are the execs do the execs care and also care enough to get the work done? Because I've seen a bunch of companies where the execs really cared, but they still weren't going to actually prioritize the work. You know, and sometimes that was the right call because they had, you know, they had a very complicated market position and they needed some features to keep the company viable and that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that I will tell, especially small startups, is you can actually kick this can down the road a while, like the security can. Don't kick the architecture can down the road because that's really expensive to fix later. So think about how you're building stuff. You can wait a little while to secure it as long as you doing that isn't putting your customers at risk, right? If you're putting people in the world at risk, then you need to, you need to fix stuff. You have, you have like ethical responsibilities there. But if it's, um, if it's not hurting anybody and you're still trying to find product market fit, you can wait a while before you build a real security team out. Just make sure you're really sure about the first one. Yeah. yeah, and and then you talked about architecture. Yeah, what, what are you looking for in like a good architecture? Um, someone should know what it is. It sounds like a joke, but seriously, no, like, I believe there you. should be an architecture. Things should be intentional. Um, ideally, everything follows the same architecture. One of the things which ends up being the biggest problem for a lot of my customers is that they simply can't change their ecosystem very quickly. That you know, we end up spending a lot of time getting them to the point where they can evolve stuff so that then they can start securing it. And like you can you can do some security improvements along the way, but a lot of it is, you know, you need, you know, you're gonna have to change your architecture over time. And whether it's because you've got a super tightly tied monolith that has like a lot of expectations about the context in which it's deployed, or you have 
17 different service architectures for your different, you know, well, there's a lot of ways to, to do that wrong. To screw up. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, uh, every every happy network is the same, every unhappy network is different. Oh my God. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of it is really just making sure that you know what the architecture is, that it's sort of sensible, and that it's that you can change it, that you can actually evolve and, and fix stuff. And this is where like the continuous delivery kind yeah. of linking yeah. comes in, right? Yeah, because if you have like if if you have stood up machines and then changed them in the field, you can't necessarily regenerate that configuration very easily. Sometimes you can't regenerate it at all. It's just like if this box dies, that's kind of the company right there. You know, that that is not a, a fun place to be in. Um, but if you're at the place where it's like, well, yeah, there's a there's a build script, and the build script we can point it at an empty GCP project or you know an empty AWS account, and it will do the whole thing if it has to. Like that's kind of the dream, and it's very rare that you're going to get there. But at the very least, any given service should be that way. You know, you should be it should be trivial to stand up a new version of a service. Ideally, you get it to the point where you've got a whole um, like a, you know you can stand up a, a prod replica just by saying, okay, deploy all of these, you know, deploy another instance of these, even if some of the larger stuff is, is more, more manually tweaked or is like, you know, a separate, separate kind of thing. Because um, that's also like, this makes a big difference for debuggability and also recoverability and all this other stuff. But, yeah, it's like, yeah. can I build a test environment, but also if my, I have a catastrophic failure, yeah. can I also like restore service? Yeah. And it's kind yeah. of the, the linkage between these two yeah. things. And I mean, how many, how many weeks is it going to take you to get things back up? And how many weeks of money do you have if everything is down? And ideally, one of those numbers is bigger than the other. And, and you know what both of those numbers are. Um, and most companies, most small companies do not know what those numbers are. Well, that's... A bit scary. Yeah, I mean, most big companies also don't know what those numbers are, but in a very different way. Okay, say more. Well, I mean, does Google know what the number is for, like, you know, if every data center caught fire? I mean, I would argue that supply chains make that unpredictable at best. Right. No, that's definitely... You know, or if they had to wipe everything at once. Yeah, I mean, that, that has actually happened. I'm sure they've thought about it. I'm sure they've... But, like, still actually figuring out what that number is becomes very difficult. Right. You know. No, that's true, because there's so many different layers and yeah. so, so much complexity to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so you're kind of, as a kind of fractional CISO, I think there's two elements to that, and you can correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. One is like the service that's being provided. Yeah, the one actual is, technical architecture, et cetera. Right, yeah. and then yeah, one, yeah. the other part is like the internal IT, like people yeah. are doing their work. Yeah. Um, which keeps you awake at night more? Um, it really depends on the company. Um, most of the time, it's going to be the laptop fleet that gets people owned to start with. Um, it's a lot of those vulnerabilities are easier to exploit. They're right there. And like, you know, if I own, especially there are also a lot of the times companies in that early phase don't have any of the internal protections. So once I own an engineer's laptop, that's it. I've got all of prod. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's going to be a lot easier to like spearfish that engineer than it is to necessarily be like, especially if it's like, yeah, like even kind of half-assed modern dev, but like stuff is patched, stuff is, you know, we don't have random ports open everywhere. Like it's probably a lot easier to own an engineer's laptop. So, you know, and I, I sometimes brought in to specifically look at the product side of things. And then I have to kind of push back and be like, I will totally do this for you, but we're also gonna look in the closet over here and find the skeletons because those are what's gonna actually get you. Um, I think, I mean, even, I think that probably, I don't think it gets more than 50-50 ever. Right. I think half of your risk is always going to be on the, on the IT side. Um, you know, because it's like, I mean, even like, what was it? The last biggest Twitter breach was also a random engineer laptop. You know, so it's, even you can, and I mean, Twitter's maybe not a great example anymore, but... Um, <laughs> the last breach was fucking Elon taking over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last other kind of breach. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of the, um, you know, you can you can be a fairly big, pretty well managed tech company, and still be in the position where, if you compromise an engineer laptop, that can direct if it's the wrong engineer, like 
Google is probably, I'm guessing AWS and Apple may also be in a place where there's no single engineer's laptop that you could compromise that would result in a data breach of, of client data. I'm not sure that there are that many other companies that are in that position. You know. Yeah, so I mean, what, what would be your basic advice to people for like basic hygiene around that? Um, basic hygiene, get rid of all the Windows boxes, get rid of all the Office installs because there's a, still a ton more malware floating around for, um, for Windows than there is for OS X. Um, Let me stop you there for a yeah. second. So, you know, my wo wife works for a nonprofit. Yep. It's all Windows. Yep. It's all Microsoft. Uh, and the pushback you're going to get is, but that's what people know. How are people supposed to do their work? If well, it turns out that there's a whole lovely industry of people who will train them how to use the other tools. And literally, that's often one of the things is that, like, you know, you will have, um, I don't know, 75% of the staff are like, yeah, whatever, I've used both, it doesn't matter. And then there's going to be a chunk of folks who, um, you know, maybe incredibly skilled, I see, you know, whatever. It's not that they're like tech illiterate or anything like that. They just don't have the experience and that's, you know, scary or they don't know that they can use, the tools can't do what I need or, you know, that kind of thing. And for the most part, they can now. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a question of doing the work to be like, no, this isn't, this isn't a negative hostile thing. I'm not taking your stuff away. We're going to help make sure that you can do exactly what you need to do. Um, and then sometimes, like, I, I have clients who have to have Windows boxes because they have some ridiculously expensive robot. And there's one company that makes the robot, and that machine, that needs a Windows box. So sometimes you're stuck with that, but you can still reduce the attack footprint everywhere else. Okay, so get rid of Windows, get rid of Office. Get rid of Office because, like, Office files are still the number one malware delivery file. Get rid of Adobe Acrobat because that's the number two delivery, you know, malware delivery, you know, uh, channel, like slightly less now, partially because it's gotten less common and they have, it has improved a lot. So has, so has office. If you really have to have office around, you're going to be buying E5 licenses and turning all the lockdown tools on. And then you end up with an office environment where it's very difficult for people to get work done. Right. You know, or you could just use Google Docs. And I'm not saying this because you work at Google. It's because it's genuinely well, thank you the, anyway. <laughs> it's genuinely the least terrible option right now. And then, so you've you've done that. What's next? Um, you should have backups. The backups should actually work. You should try restoring the backups and make sure they work. Um, this is not a small team problem. Like there are plenty of hundred plus engineer companies that have critical data that they cannot replicate, which is not backed up and or backups that they've never tested. So the sooner you do that, the better. And then, you know, make sure that you keep doing it. But, um, but that's probably the next big thing. Um, and kind of once you've got those three, I guess the other, the other big one is get YubiKeys in, right? Get some kind of U2F token. We'll see on the passkey stuff. I, um, it's new enough and I don't have a good enough handle on like, the deployment scenarios and the failure modes and that kind of thing. Like I'm super excited by it, mm. but I just don't know quite what's, I don't feel like I have a good instinct for the places it's gonna break yet. But get Yuba keys, make sure that everyone is using them in U2F mode. If you are using workspace, maybe consider asking certainly everybody on like engineering, exec, legal, and HR to turn on advanced protection mode. Um, and then if you, if you do this, it means you just get to stop thinking about credential phishing because this, you know, the, the tools are going to take care of it for you now. Um, you, you literally just get to stop worrying about it. And anytime there's uh, that kind of a serious security issue where you can just get rid of the security issue and take it off your radar, great. You know, because if you've, if you've stopped everybody from using the file formats that are most likely to contain malware, um, and you've stopped everybody from being in a situation where they can give their credentials away because their credentials are tied to hardware. Now you get to stop thinking about phishing mm. because it just doesn't, I mean like, yeah, you still have to deal with like uh, wire, wire fraud scams and stuff, but that's a different problem, mm -hmm. right? Because the phishing problem is you have staff who are paid to click on things because that is literally their job mm -hmm. is to click on things in emails and do what emails say. And then you're angry at them because they clicked on things in emails and did what the email said you cannot win this one. You mm. cannot train your way out of like an inherent security vulnerability in the structure of your ecosystem. And if you try to, you're just gonna piss people off. You know, like the number of phishing campaigns that I've, like phishing training campaigns 
that I've seen that left people really distrustful of IT and security is huge. You know, this doesn't, this doesn't help you. Um, so instead, go actually solve the problem. Make it safe to do what people's job is. Do not make their jobs inherently dangerous. So yeah, so, you know, if you get those two things in, like, again, that's most of your compromises are gonna be one of those two things. And it also means you don't have people complaining that they keep getting woken up by like 2FA auth spam, you know? Like that was that Twitter breach, is somebody just uh, 2FA auth spammed an engineer like 100,000 times, literally, and eventually like emailed them and said, well, I'm just gonna keep doing this until you click yes. Hmm. And eventually the guy just clicked yes to make it stop. Wow. And I mean, like, there's a lot of other failures in that context about security awareness and who, you know, why didn't this get noticed? Yeah, I mean, like, this is not, there were many layers to, to something like that happening, but small versions of that happen all the time. You know, you don't want it to be like the employees used to always clicking a yes, so they click yes without thinking about it. That like, oh, I didn't just do a thing, or they did just do a thing that should have triggered that, but they got the wrong one, you, you know? Like, we can just not have these problems. We can have nice things. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Um, yes. Um, um, so we've talked a bit about the IT side. Yeah. Uh, earlier on, you said, you know, that the hello world yeah. that takes, you know, 100 people or 200 yeah, yeah. people. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about um, kind of basic hygiene and, and kind of how you get set up. Say you're starting a startup yep. and you want to build something. What are the, you know, the, the top few things you would say that you need to get in place from the beginning that are going to save you a ton of pain and misery later on? I mean, literally just running down the stack, the first thing is how are you going to deploy stuff? You know, how are you going to deploy stuff and how are you setting up infrastructure? Um, I'm a fan of Terraform mostly because it seems to be the least platform locked and kind of the least terrible option, but have some kind of IAC system. You know, don't, don't just start setting stuff up by hand. Um, have an actual deploy pipeline. It doesn't matter which one, you know, but have, have some kind of deploy pipeline, have some kind of infrastructure automation in from ground zero and get SSO set up for whatever your cloud environment is. So you have like some kind of auth structure that makes sense, you know, and then as you're building stuff out, especially if you're actually starting from scratch, yeah, start working in containers from the start. You know, don't work, don't work with long-lived VMs unless you have specific requirements that require either hardware boxes or long-lived long -lived hosts, um, which you, like those are genuinely pretty rare, you know? And a lot of the things like we need a Hadoop cluster, which has to be long-lived. Okay, but can someone else run it? Mm -hmm. You know, can you make it like, you know, do you need to build that authentication or can you make it the problem of someone whose job it is to build that authentication mm -hmm. who is probably better than you are? And yeah, those systems have costs. And if you're in a like low margin per end user, like this, you know, the scaling problems are real. However, you're probably not actually hitting those scaling problems until after you've figured out product market fit, mm -hmm. right? So fine, outsource auth until you figure out if there's a company there. Once mm -hmm. there's a company there, if it's a company where Firebase or whatever you're using costs too much per user, then bring it in, because at that point, you're probably at least closer to being able to do it competently. And in general, like, yeah, if it's not your core competency, don't do it. You know, like a lot of, you know, one of the things, at some point you need log centralization, right? You're gonna have to stand up indexers and ingest and all this stuff. Is it your job to run an L cluster? No, it's probably not your job to run an out cluster, so don't do it because they eat teams. You know, I've seen a, a, literally a 10 person team, not just like, like, you know, entirely consumed with that work, but everybody on the team quit. Oh my God. Because it was that much of a fire. So just let somebody else do it. Like, yeah, it's expensive, but you know what you're paying for, you know? Um, and like, especially on small teams, Evaluating the cost of hiring is a real thing, you know, and I'm not like, you know, I've also, there is also a time where it is time to start insourcing stuff. You know, there's a time when it doesn't make sense to, to give AWS a hundred million dollars a month or whatever your, you know, whatever your AWS bill is, because actually the cost structure around running your own hardware is more complicated than people think, but also not necessarily as bad as people think. But that's not necessarily when you're starting out. Like, don't start out there. 
unless you're actually starting with 200 engineers. Yeah, I mean, you know? having a $10 million um, cloud bill is actually yeah. a good problem to have because it means- It means you can pay a $10 million cloud, well, hopefully it means you can pay a $10 million <laughs> cloud bill. If you were expecting it to be $10 million, it's right. probably a good thing. Right. Um, you know, but yeah, now, great, now you're at the point where, you know, okay, yeah, you can think about cost savings and structure and all this kind of stuff, but you, you gotta get there first, yeah. you know? And, but I think, yeah, building cleanly, documenting as you go along, um, it's nice if you if you have business rules about how the company runs that are like you know if you if you're running a merchant side or something like probably write those down. Um, in general, you do not like the authoritative reference is always going to be the code. However, you don't want it to be the only reference. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge fan of orientating documentation that's not trying to capture all the details because again the code is always going to be authoritative but it will help you bring people up to speed faster. It will tell people what is where in the ecosystem. Like, what, is this, what does this service do? I don't know, you know what I mean? This is possibly also like, I don't know, trauma from my early days as a, as a code auditor when I would literally get handed a zip file. Uh -huh. No docs, no running instance, literally just a zip file of uncommented code. Oh my God. Find bugs. And eventually you learn how to do that, but it's a lot of like learning to, you know, it's the, the kind of CIA, the men who stare at goats kind of like, you know, you stare at things, then eventually three years later, patterns start to emerge kind of thing. The first three years are, yeah. But, painful. Uh, painful <laughs> and, and weird. Um, but you can avoid this by just having some basic documentation. It's also, among other things, it's really good for equity because, you know, if you have employees from underrepresented minorities, you know what they get penalized for a lot more than white dudes? Asking questions, mm -hmm. especially questions or things they should know. Mm -hmm. um, so you're literally going to make it easier for them to succeed in your company, which means that you have a more diverse team, which means that you have a team that's better at solving weird problems because, you know, really homogenous teams are not actually very effective a lot of the time. Yeah, although they are very good at agreeing with each other. They are really, yeah, and, and being wrong quickly, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I think it, and I mean, the other, it also, it, it, like, it speeds up onboarding, right? If you have a company that you know is going to grow, why would you not do the things that you can do early on to make it easier for you to grow later, like documenting stuff? Yeah, I mean, and that, that's a commonality with both equity and with, um, uh, Kind of getting things right from a yeah. process perspective yeah, is like absolutely. do the things, don't wait. <laughs> like, yeah, do, do the do, things that are going to be, that are cheap to start with and very expensive later. Yeah. You know, and and stuff like yeah, at some point you need to you need to deal with security detection, right? Um, it's expensive to build out a security operations center. You know, so you're probably going to want managed detection first, and even that, if you're a really early startup. And, and you're not gonna put users at risk, again, that caveat, you know, you can kick the can down the road a bit, yeah. you know? And like, you don't want AWS's security team to be your notification service, but you know, it's better than going bankrupt, you know? Um, and you can just sort of bolt that on later, Yeah. you know? And um, I think, you know, the writing things down thing as well, so much of auditing is actually just making sure you're doing the things you said you were doing. Yep. And so if you yep. write down the things that you say you're doing, it's yep. going to make auditing yeah. a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I do say that in a lot of contexts, um, security certifications are primarily a marketing expense because mm -hmm. not that they don't serve, well, okay. If a security certification is the thing that is forcing you to do security work, you should change your fundamental attitude towards security first. Do the stuff that you actually need to do and then worry about the compliance. Um, but they're primarily a tool for making the state of your security system legible to customers. You know, and they're super important for that, mm -hmm. but that's primarily what they do. Yeah, if you're doing it right, you're gonna find it's actually pretty straightforward. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure as always. Um, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Uh, how can people find you if they want to know more? Yeah, it's been lovely. Um, if you wanna know more, you can go to structures.systems. I'm Ella at structures.systems, and uh, I'd be happy to talk more. Fantastic. Um, well, thanks very much. Uh, make sure you catch Eleanor's talk when it comes up, and uh, <laughs> thanks to GoTo for hosting us. Thanks for having me. <laughs>